Hello, uh, I'd like to start by thanking Orla and all the team at the American Library for putting on today's event. Um, so my talk is titled Mud, Murals and Morale. And uh, I'd like to start the presentation by taking you inside the Nissan hut located on an airbase air base deep in the Norfolk countryside. It's a winter's evening in early 1943 and the atmosphere of the barracks is thick with cigarette smoke and the smell of broiling pork. Above the noise of men chatting is the crackle of spattering grease as potatoes fry on top of a pot-bellied stove. Sitting around the stove is the crew of Little Beaver, pictured here. Um, they belong to the 44 Bomb Group, located at Shipton Air Base, and this is their home. When asked by a reporter why his crew weren't eating in the mess hall, Little Beaver pilot Chester Phillips replies with the following. We didn't want to wear blouses and pinks and get all dulled up. To get away from that, we just had to learn to cook, so we did. It goes without saying that food in the 8th Air Force was vital to the morale of the bomb group. As Derwin has explained, certain food, whether it was pancakes, fried chicken or ice cream, provided much needed comfort to young men far from home. Disliked foods, meanwhile, threatened to dampen the morale of men with even the most resolute palates. It was commonly joked that during emergency landings, crews should aim for the nearest Brussels sprouts field in order to deplete supplies of the dreaded vegetable. But as the scene around the stove of this particular Nissan hut shows, it wasn't just what was being eaten that was important, but how and where food was consumed. After his chat with the crew of Little Beaver, reporter John Redding concluded that the phrase properly fed deals with more than cooking alone. According to Redding, crews have fostered a feeling of oneness among themselves to a point where they not only live together, but they eat together, fight together. And when the time comes, if it must, they will die together. For the crew of the Little Beaver, the meal they ate together in the Nissan hut um, that night would be one of their last. On the 14th of May, 1943, the plane was hit by flak on a mission to Kiel. All but four of the crew perished in the subsequent crash. Little Beaver was one of many B-24s and B-17s lost in the first year of the 8th Air Force's operations. In 1943, bomber crews were tasked with a 25 mission tour of duty. Most crews never made it past their fifth. In summer 1943, it wasn't uncommon for bomber groups to lose 30 planes a mission a loss that equates to 300 men. During this dark time, flight surgeons recorded increasing numbers of stress-related symptoms among combat crews. Nausea, weight loss, and tremors chief among them. Morale was at an all-time low as flyers came to terms with their own mortality. Conditions at the newly built bases didn't help matters, with Spartan accommodation and drab surroundings doing little to boost morale. For the group commanders, finding ways to distract men from the horrors of battle became a priority. As a psychiatric consultant for the 8th Air Force stated, a flyer is a human being with a sensitive set of nerves, muscles and emotions. To most flyers, life in the war is strange, chaotic interlude. The whole experience is uncomfortable and artificial, with no relation to any life that went before. This is obviously true of actual combat with all of its horrifying experiences. It's equally true of the unspectacular daily routine in barracks and muddy fields. It quickly became clear to group commanders that in order to counter the strangeness of life in the air, they'd have to make life on the ground as familiar and comfortable as possible. As this presentation will show, by the end of the war, many of the drab RAF buildings have been transformed into homely spaces, decorated with murals and kitted out with all manner of luxuries. Over the next few minutes, we'll tour a typical 8th Air Force base and glimpse inside the clubs, mess halls and private dining rooms where men spent much of their time. So we're just going to change over to Google Earth. So. Um, here I have a site plan for uh, Flixton, otherwise known as RAF Bungie, which was home to the 446 bomb group. So this is on the 1945 image. Um, you can just see what it actually looks like today. So this is 2021. On this image, we can actually see really clearly where the, the, the airfield and the technical site was, and then this here is the um, dispersed site. And the, the dispersed site is probably located about a mile away from, from the technical site. Um, and the dispersed site is concealed within the woodlands, farms and fields of the Suffolk countryside. And it contained administrative sites, sick quarters, accommodation and communal areas. And it was at these communal sites that dining and recreational facilities were located. So there were several dining rooms on the communal site at Flixton. As, as plan shows. Um, RAF plans show that there were two officers' messes, two sergeants' messes, and two enlisted men's dining rooms for other ranks. 
However, as these site plans were drawn up by the RAF, they don't necessarily reflect the feeding arrangements adopted by the American occupants. For example, the US Army were less strict when it came to officers and other ranks meeting together. At Flixen, there would have been a separate mess for combat crews to, to dine together, regardless of rank. And this was partly to cater for the specific dietary requirements of combat crews. So early on in the air war, it became clear to doctors that gassy vegetables, for example, could have painful effects at high altitude, hence why air crews were fed a controlled diet. And this arrangement also meant that combat crews could eat together as a small family unit before a mission. And this offered an opportunity to develop rapport outside of the confines of the bomber. Um, so here is most likely that the combat crew mess was located um, on this particular communal site. Um, so there's, there's two communal sites overall, and this is um, the, the more southerly one. So I'm just going to go back to my presentation. So here we have a few, few photos um, of, of mess halls. Um, we have some of the kitchen staff preparing food. Um, here a gunner stands outside his uh, gunner's mess. Um, as you can see, the sign said, no, there's no ground personnel allowed. And it was off, um, quite common for ground personnel to be fed in separate buildings, which did create some, um, some tension, um, especially for, for the ground personnel who were, who were working long hours on the airfield and then they had to trudge all the way back um, up to their mess, which is often quite far away from when they were working. Okay, so um, for combat crews, the one meal remembered above all others tends to be the pre-mission breakfast, which would have been served as early as 2am on some mission days. A recurring notion in veterans' accounts is that air crews were fed better quality food depending on the threat posed by the mission. Three or third bomb group radio operator Ben Smith remembered, we could have pancakes, eggs, sunny side up, or any way we wanted them. To me, it seemed a somewhat macabre occasion and I found their jollity very disquieting and out of place. I could eat none of the breakfast anyway. Even to this day, day I have butterflies before breakfast. For others, the opportunity to eat fresh eggs rather than the powdered variety helped to take their minds and their stomachs off the impending mission. From, from 1943, crews were fed on American rations, typically supplemented by local produce as and when it was available. Mess halls usually comprised of two Nissen huts joined in the middle by a kitchen. Um, as, as this um, photo shows, um, this is some um, kitchen staff, I believe, at Grafton Underwood preparing turkeys for, for the Thanksgiving meal. And you can just see um, to the right hand side, there's a Nissen hut. So uh, the kitchen is located in the middle and there would have been serving hatches on either side. Um, and uh, we've also got a picture here of Thomas Kybelski. And uh, he was a baker at Thorpe Abbott's and he actually went on to open three bakeries in Michigan after the war. And uh, the kitchen would have been subdivided into different areas. So there would have been the bakery um, and yeah, different food preparation areas. And most messels were designed to provide meals from between 500 and 1000 personnel at, at each sitting. While there was no electricity in the kitchens, hot water did allow for the operation of huge dishwashers, relieving some pressure from the overworked kitchen staff. And there was a difference in the facilities provided in the officer's mess and in the enlisted men's mess, as the two photos show. Um, however, the tables were turned on Thanksgiving and Christmas, where it was tradition for officers to serve enlisted men. Holidays also offered the opportunity for improved rations. Um, we've got a menu here from Thorpe Abbott's which shows what was on offer um, on Christmas uh, Day, 1943. So we've got chicken gumbo soup, uh, roast young turkey, um, and then all of the trimmings, cranberry sauce, um, bread dressing, snowflake potatoes. So um, especially for, for wartime standards, it would have been a very luxurious meal. Um, and decorations were also put up in the messels in a bid to create a festive atmosphere. And another way to make the base more homely was to invite local children to Christmas parties, which happened at most bases, Trucks would head out into the local villages to pick up children and gifts were handed out by an American Santa Claus and a movie was usually shown in the base theatre. And most special of all was a Christmas dinner, a feast of turkey and cranberry sauce, a condiment that was yet to make its way onto the plates of the average Brit. So it would most definitely have been a treat for the, the young visitors on base. So after eating a meal at the mess hall, it was common for personnel to make their way into one of the many clubs on base. Most places would have had an officer's club, an NCO's club, um, and an enlisted men's club. As the name suggests, these catered to different ranks, with the officer's clubs tending to be the most lavish. 
and a lot of the improvements were actually brought about um, because they charged a subscription fee so officers wanting to use the facilities would pay a monthly monthly fee and that often went back into improving the clubs Nissan huts were transformed into welcoming environments with comfy furniture, circular bars and roaring fireplaces. Food was served from the snack bar and in some cases table service was also provided. Murals often decorated the walls of these clubs. The images depicted range from pin-up girls, Disney characters and unit insignia to wistful US landscapes. These murals were usually painted by talented artists from within the ranks. At Shipton, for example, several of the ground crew had actually worked for Disney Studios before the war. In other instances, civilian artists were brought in. At Chelveston, famous British cartoonist Bruce Burns' father, known for his old Bill character, became the official artist of the 305th Bomb Group. He was responsible for this huge mural in the officers' club, showing a GI returning to the US on board the Queen Mary. And as you can see, he's incorporated different details, uh, structural details of the building into his design. Um, and we've also got some portholes um, on the windows as well, which is a nice little touch. Unfortunately, this particular mural has been lost to time, but others do survive. So the Red Feather Club at Horham is a former NCO's club that has been painstakingly restored to its wartime condition. Murals depict medieval themed scenes, including a knight on a rearing steed. But even in these images of merry old England, home was never far from the picture. As you can see, the knight is brandishing the state flag of Texas. And he also wears a red feather in, in his cap, um, which was the, the um, symbol used in the insignia for the 95th bomb group. So why were murals such a common form of interior decoration on base? The promotion of muralism can partly be attributed to the emergence of soldier art schemes at US training camps. These were experimental art departments that drew artistic talents from within the ranks to produce murals and interior design schemes. The programs promoted the base commanders the virtues of art as a way to improve the morale, happiness and bravery of the soldier. These recommendations were published in a book in 1943 titled Art and the Soldier. And in turn, the soldier art schemes took their lead from the public murals painted during the Depression era as part of, part of the works program administration. This short video from the 1930s describes how murals were painted in the dining hall of America's top military college, West Point. Painters too contribute their bit to making the works program a real and permanent accomplishment. These reproductions of the American scene of today will make this one of the most fertile periods of our country's art. Some of this work is done on canvas, but much of it is created on the walls of our schools, libraries, and other public buildings in the form of mural paintings. Of particular interest is the great mural in the mess hall of the Military Academy at West Point, depicting great warriors of history. So, whereas the officers and NCOs had their own clubs on base, the Red Cross. Um, Aero Club was intended to give the enlisted ranks somewhere to go and quote relax and enjoy yourself in your own way after a tough day. Although clubs were officially open from about 3 p.m. until midnight it was commonly accepted that um, American Red Cross staff would welcome service pe personnel at any time of the day. At Flixton the Aero Club referred to as the Institute on RAF plans was situated on communal site 4 um, as we just saw in, on the previous map so it's on the, on the second communal site. Um, so Nissan Huts accommodated a large snack bar with room for dancing, a games room furnished with card tables, a room with snooker tables, a library stocking American magazines and hometown newspapers and a lounge with a brick fireplace. The layout of the club was in intended to suit the specific needs of the group. Improvements were frequent and driven largely by the men's own suggestions. Limited funds and wartime shortages meant that Aero Club staff relied on their patrons for physical improvements to the buildings. At Wendling, the Ordnance Department donated bomb fins to be made into floor stand ashtrays, while discarded bomb crates were repurposed for tables and chairs. Again, murals were frequently painted by Red Cross staff or base personnel. At Tiefen Green, group historian Jerome Kegel noted that life around the base now was beginning to be a bit more livable and to some degree like home. The Aero Club lounge has been decorated by Corporal Ferris e. Parsons, deep sea murals to add a peaceful atmosphere. Corporal Gerald E. Brown, has painted Robin Hood scenes on the wall. All these things serve to make life a bit more interesting and add to the joys of being in merry old England. So the murals on the walls of the Flixton Aero Club still survive today, although sadly their condition has deteriorated um, in recent years. Um, 
Some interesting examples include Squadron Insignia in the Lounge, a circus-themed games room, and a large map of the United States in what may have been one of the reading rooms. And if you look closely enough, you can still make out signatures scrawled over some of the cities. And this was used as a way for personnel to see if there were any other GIs hailing from their hometown. So on the, in the photo on the right, you can see um, a wartime photo of one of the lounges. And you can just make out um, this vulture insignia, which is one of the squadron insignias uh, for the 446 bomb group. And then this is it today in its uh, current condition. So the whole ethos of the Aero Club revolved around the idea of home, not least in terms of the type and volume of food the clubs served. At Thorpe Abbotts, two GI set to work on starting a victory garden. This, uh, with, with the project, produce being used to supplement the food served in the Aero Club. And in January 1945, the Aero Club at Shipton served a whopping 133,919 snacks at an expense of £927, equivalent to about £40,000 today. The director notes that the month's expenditure was slightly higher than usual as the club had managed to secure a large shipment of Coca-Cola. So what kind of food was being served at the Red Cross Club? At Shipton, the Red Cross direct director reported that hops, hot soup and macaroni seem to be great favourites in the snack bar. We do a booming business frying eggs um, with, the, with the men bringing their own eggs. And Miss Seaman, our cook, is most willing to spend her evenings frying these eggs for the boys. We also paint the leftover eggshells to make decorations for the Christmas tree. And in this top image, um, you, can, you can see um, Red Cross staff helping um, some of the GI, uh, GIs to, to fry eggs. So while many of the everyday tasks fell at the feet of the British assistants, it was the American staff members who were sent up to the front line on mission days. Armed with a tray of donuts and an urn of fresh coffee, staff would await the arrival of exhausted crews in the interrogation room. For those returning from long, arduous missions, the refresh refreshments were well received. The Red Cross donut, or sinker as they were affectionately referred to, were much preferred to their army mess equivalent. Cooked from a special mix shipped straight from the US, they were a taste of home when the men needed them most. Red Cross staff also took their clubmobile out onto the flight line to provide some much needed comfort to the ground personnel working through the night to prepare planes for missions. Clubmobiles were remodelled London Green Line buses, driven by an English driver and operated by three American women. Each clubmobile was fitted with a kitchen consisting of a built-in donut machine and a Primus stove for heating water for coffee. One side of the kitchen opened out for serving food and drinks, while the rear of the clubmobile consisted of a lounge area with built-in benches that also doubled the sleeping bugs. The lounge also contained a record player, current music records, books, candy, gum and cigarettes. So now I'd just like to play a short oral history interview with Ernie Tawney, who was the Red Cross, staff, uh, Red Cross director at Flixton. The film contains some photos of the interior of the club, as well as um, clips of Erna talking about the hard work that was put in by the Red Cross staff. Starting around about yeah, and that kind of changed the pattern because uh, we were at the club all the day, and they finally would start coming in in the afternoon. Although some of them, if they were not doing their jobs, they weren't all flying. They were all kinds of fellows that took care of the planes, took care of the cars, drove to places. They had to fly 30 missions. And after 30 missions, if they were coming back to their 30th mission, we always had a pie for them. And the uh, British pie was very different than our kind of pie. It was just a big piece of pastry with jam on it. But every one of them got one of those pies, and they were looking forward to it. Just the fact that they, kept, they actually got back. They would show me their pieces of flak that was shot into the planes. It's not a very happy experience flying over and dropping bombs. Oh, but your love. We had several nice big rooms. Oh, we had a little table. And there was a big, huge room with two pianos. Music in the evening. Bought cards and they just sit around and read. We had library books. We'd have dances. We'd figure a dance. We'd put posters around the local villages saying that we were sending trucks through at a certain time. And that was very successful, of course. And the local British girls come in dancing. And we had 
uh, some of the GIs from different bases had little orchestras come and play for the music. And that's when I would do some singing too. So the last stop on the tour of the communal site is the post exchange known as the PX. This building provided luxury items that would have been hard to find in wartime Britain. Coca-Cola, gum and candy were sold here, although supply problems often limited their sale. The PX also provided a gift service where personnel could order presents to be sent home to loved ones in the US. Over time, the PX offerings became more ambitious. ambitious. In 1944, some base PXs were kitted out with a soda fountain to provide Coca-Cola on tap and ice cream counter freezers. And I think you can see them at the post exchange at Dean Thorpe in this picture. However, US military officials were wary of how this would look to their British hosts who were struggling with rationing. The solution was to install the equipment out of sight of any passing British civilian, civilians. At Poddington, the new soda fountain was so popular um, that they managed to issue roughly 21,000 glasses of Coca-Cola in its first days, first 18 days. So by the time the Americans left in 1945, the communal sites at the 100 or so USAF bases had been transformed into domesticated and Americanized spaces. The improved facilities not only gave the personnel more choice when it came to eating and drinking, but also the surroundings to be able to properly relax after a hard day's work. It goes without saying that the sustained morale of the 8th Air Force owes a lot to the hardworking ground personnel who endeavoured to carve out homes away from home in East Anglia. I hope you enjoyed that whistle-stop um, tour of the communal site and please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. <laughs>